Yeah, um, just out of curiosity, here, how many of you this week have taken any uh, Shark Weekend on Discovery Channel? Oh, come on, people. You are missing out. Yeah, okay, thank you. There's some enthusiasm in that wave. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if, if you've seen this or not. It's actually kind of fascinating television. Um, Shark Week now is in its 27th year, and it's the longest running cable TV event in history, um, which most people don't know. This, this year, Shark Week is projected to set records for the number of viewers who, who not only sort of tune in to, to take in these sort of fascinating fish, but I think more so to, to sort of take in the unending number of people who seem to be compelled to jump in the water with these fish. Um, I don't understand those people. I, I, I don't understand um, how you sign up for a job where in the list of occupational hazards includes the statement of likely will be eaten by a shark. Um, it, I, there's risk taking and then there's um, stupidity. Um, I can't, what, what happens? In, in somebody's life when you're deciding on what you're going to do for a career, you say, you know, I, th I think I'd really like to swim with great white sharks. Like, that seems like a great avenue to, to take. And I was thinking about this whole idea of, of occupational hazards this week. Um, the risks that we all face in, in the experience of of life, and, and maybe let's talk about this from the perspective of what are the risks that we take in our experience in, in the church. Um, for me personally, as, as somebody who has a career in, in ministry, I've kind of come to recognize that, that one of the occupational hazards that I experience is this, it's either this self-imposed or, or culturally imposed sort of fear of being found out right? It's this fear of, of being found out. I, I don't think that this is unique or true only for those of us that, that work in full-time ministry or call ministry or a vocation. I think it's, it's somewhat of an occupational hazard within Christianity as a whole, within, within the life of, of the church. We tell ourselves, or at least I tell myself, that, that I should have outgrown this by now. This, this isn't something that I should continue to, to struggle with. The fear is that if anyone knew the struggles, if they saw the parts of our hearts that we work so hard to keep hidden, if somebody saw in there, then we would be exposed as a fraud and shame for our inability to, to fix our most basic and fundamental issues. So we hide. We, we put our best face forward. We pretend to, to have our act together and we live in this constant fear that somebody is going to find out the ugly reality that I continue to struggle with sin in my life. That we continue to struggle with sin in our lives. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's a reality that, that we all experience at one level or another. It's, it's this occupational hazard. As I was processing this this week, um, I was listening to, to Pastor Bruce, and, and I had the opportunity to hear Pastor Jonathan um, last week in the worship cafe. Um, talking with the Trek students and the families that were meeting over there, and they were preaching through Nehemiah chapter 8. And, and I was just um, impacted by the result of, of the people hearing God's word, God's word being reintroduced into the community. Let's, let's look at this once again just for a ref uh, refresher here. This is Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. It says, and, op and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. 
I, I love that response. Those two sort of profound things that happen as a result of this. They hear God's word and the people automatically, almost intrinsically just respond in worship. They hear the story again and they cannot help but, but fall on their faces in worship of their God. But secondarily then, their hearts are simultaneously broken with, with conviction. They're broken with conviction. It's in this place of, of worship and conviction, which by the way, it strikes me as we talk about this, we look through Nehemiah, I think those two often go hand in hand. The response of, of worship and conviction. It's something that we experience together. It's in this place that we pick up the story now in Nehemiah 9. And we, we experience a response of confession. A response of confession. This is Nehemiah 9, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. They stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, uh, their God, for a quarter of the day. And for a quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord, their God. As we consider this passage today, as we look at Nehemiah 9, I, I want us to think about um, the idea, this response of confession, not only from the perspective of, of Israel and sort of the original context, but also as a model, a model of individual and corporate confession in our own lives, personally, individually, but, but together as, as the church and what this looks like and how this happens. I think this chapter provides for us some fundamental aspects or qualities that ultimately produce the response of confession. It ultimately creates that in our lives and becomes that antidote then for that that occupational hazard, that fear of, of being found out that so often can paralyze our faith, that traps us, that we get stuck in. So as we work our way through this passage, I, I want to highlight a couple things that have stood out to me. And the first thing that I notice here in, in this response of confession in Nehemiah 9 is the renewed awareness of the nature of God. A renewed awareness of the nature of God. We're going to pick this up in the second half of verse 5. And we're going to read, we're going to read for a while here, but... but Take this in. He says, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth with all that's in it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God of Abram. And brought him out of Ur of Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. He found his heart faithful before you and made with him a covenant to give to his offspring the land of Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Prezisite, the Jebusite, and the Gergesite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and you heard their cry at the Red Sea. You performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of the land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through in the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light the way for them in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them the right rules and true laws and good statutes and commandments. You made them known, you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them them, these commandments and statutes as a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go possess the land that you had sworn 
to give them. Let's pause there for a second because the first thing that stands out to me is this response of confession amongst the people is brought out by retelling the story. By retelling their story of a covenant relationship with the almighty creator God. Israel is reminded of the nature and the character of God and it is ultimately his character, his nature that stands as the standard for holiness. You see, I think the trap that, that Israel oftentimes fell into, and we do as well, is, is somewhat of the comparison game. For, for you and I, we either have this tendency to, to compare ourselves first to, to people around us. The problem here is that uh, beyond the reality of just a compromised standard, um, the problem here is that we can always find someone that we believe is better off than we are, and, and we become depressed, or we find someone that we view to be worse off than we are, and we become inflated. We get caught in the turbulence of constant comparison, and all along the real issue is the gauge that we use to measure ourselves is just as flawed and just as broken as we are. In the end, what, whatever the result, we fail to gain an accurate read on our own struggles with sin because we're too busy lining them up against someone else's. We compare ourselves with each other. Secondarily, though, um, I think we have a tendency to compare ourselves to a diminished view of God. This is, this is a part of, of Israel's history, whether it's the golden calf that was shaped at the, mount, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, or the synchronization of, of their Yahweh God with the gods of the surrounding culture. Israel has repeatedly allowed themselves to create a God of their own liking. And they use that as their standard of comparison. And we do the very same thing in our own lives, in our own cultures. We live in a culture, I believe, that isn't necessarily opposed to the idea of God as long as it's a God on our own terms. We decide what God is for and, and what he's against. How we should act and what ultimately then is, is right or wrong. In the end, we can justify almost anything in our lives because we have created a God of our own making, our own version of who he is. But here in, in Nehemiah 9, this whole process, this experience, this corporate confession, the people of Israel now respond because they've been drawn back to the reality of the one true God. This is, this, this God is, is, is the light of the world. He's the one who created the heavens and, and the earth, who gives life to everything, who established the covenant with Abraham who is faithful in all of his problems, uh, promises, who led them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, who provided and protected in, in the desert, and who ultimately uh, delivered them into the promised land. It's now this God, the one true God, the holy God, that, that they are seeing themselves in light of. And, and their response is to worship him. Because their own unfaithfulness has now been exposed. And what results then is, is transparent repentance. Transparent repentance. This passage here in, in, in Nehemiah 9, it now shifts a bit because in the midst of this praise of God's faithfulness, of this, this recognition of his character... They begin to acknowledge their own obstinance, their own rebellion, their own disobedience. They talk about their own sin and the sin of their fathers and their grandfathers. There's an interesting pat pattern here that develops in the rest of, of Nehemiah 9 because it'll sort of go back and forth between expressions of, of their own sin. They'll stand up and say, we have sinned against you. But almost always, immediately following this, but you have been faithful. You have kept your promise. They return to the nature and the character of God. Let's pick this up again in, uh, in verse 
16, Nehemiah 9, verse 16. You'll see this pattern take place here. It said, but they and our fathers acted presumptuously and they stiffened their necks and did not obey your commands. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. The rest of chapter 9 here maintains this pattern. It's interesting thinking about this event here in the life of Israel. Because this nature of what's taking place here is both personal and it's public. Imagine for a moment, if you will, if, if we all stood up together and in unison began confessing sin out loud together in this place. We don't, we don't really have a box to kind of put something like this in because the idea of confession for us and in the church is oftentimes such a personal and private thing. In our own modern expression of of worship, this is often something that we leave to ourselves. In the New Testament area, uh, era, we can and we do take our sins directly to God. We should. That's what Scripture tells us to do. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the question that I'm left asking as I read this passage and I think about this and I've been wrestling with this week, is what does confession look like in the context of community? What does it mean for the church to be a confessional community? There's a very communal aspect to the confession that's happening here in Nehemiah. And I would argue that this is instructive to, to our own practice and experience of confessing sin. Let's turn real quick to James chapter 5, verse 16. Many of you will know this. This is in the NIV. I've been reading out of the ESV, but this verse is one that goes back to childhood for me. It says, therefore, if you confess your, uh, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. I have read and, and even memorized this passage without fully considering the impact of, of this verse. I've always kind of taken this verse as like a suggestion or a best practice, right? If you confess, but that's not, that's not the wording here. Um, James chapter 5 or 16 is a command. Confess your sins to one another. Not, not if we like it, not if it's comfortable, not if it feels good, but this is, this is a part of our, our, our worship. Additionally, then, though, what's interesting in this verse is that the end result of the confession in the context of community is for our healing. See, perhaps the experience of, of confession in the context of community is intended to be the means wherein God's work of, of forgiveness and of restoration is experienced, is felt in our own hearts and, our, and in our lives, the way that we receive it. Um, on, on a personal note, and, and, and maybe you can relate to this, um, I don't know if you've ever had a season in your life where you just seem to be caught in the cycle of sin. I, I have. Um, you know those, those sort of nagging sins that you just can't seem to, to shake. And I'll keep going to God in, in moments of confession and, and moments of repentance. But I keep finding myself being defeated by the same struggles, by the same sin. Now, in addition to the guilt that I feel as a result of the sin, shame begins to pile up because, because I can never seem to make any progress. Maybe this sounds familiar to some of you. Shame then causes me to hide, to, to, to fake it. I need to maintain um, my, my appearances, to keep up the image of, of one who has his act together. So that, that causes me to actually flee authentic community. 
I run from being real with people instead of engaging the very thing that God has provided for my healing. You see, when I, when I find myself in that place, and, and let me be clear, I do. This isn't just theory or a theological concept. This is, this is my experience. When I find myself in that place, victory is often gained when I eventually store up enough courage, or probably more honestly, desperation, to go to the people that God has put around me, to go to the community that God has provided and say to them, guys, I need to share something with you. I need to be real with you for a moment. I need you to pray for me, to speak grace into my life, to remind me that the Savior is bigger than my sin. I need to confess. But I also need to confess in the context of community, surrounded by the people who support and love me. I was discussing this with um, a friend of mine, some, somewhat of an accountability partner, and we were talking about this. He said, you know, in order for shame to grow in our lives, um, three sort of fundamental things need to be there. So if we were to kind of create a greenhouse effect for shame in our lives, these, these things need to be there. There needs to be secrecy, silence, and judgment. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. Shame thrives in that culture. But if you take that same amount of sin and you, you put it in the light and you douse it with grace, that sin, that shame, it cannot survive. That's the antidote. To bring it into the light, to have people speak grace into it. And sin then is defeated. And, and here's been my own experience for this. And the opportunities and the times when I have gone to the community that God has provided for me and I have laid out my sin and I have asked them to speak grace into my life, the results are incredible because there's no more hiding. I don't have to pretend anymore the freedom of no longer um, keeping up appearances. This incredible weight is just lifted. We experience freedom in our lives. Secondarily, then now I have support. I have people walking alongside of me. I'm no longer in this alone, and I get it. I know that when I confess my sin to God, that he promises to be there with me. But one of the ways that he is there with us is by providing brothers and sisters in Christ to journey alongside of us. Thirdly, then, though, it's awareness. Now I can begin to see the work that God wants to do in my life through the body of Christ. My eyes are open. I'm no longer being blinded by the impact of my own sin. God frees us in the context of community. See, here in, in these verses in Nehemiah, I don't, I don't think that we are merely reading some sort of weird Old Testament ceremony, which is the way I tend, have a tendency to kind of approach a passage like this. I'm like, man, I'm glad I didn't live back then, you know? But I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what we see in front of us is a model for confession in the context of, con uh, in the context of community. It is, in fact, incredibly relevant to us in the life of the church, to our own individual, specific, personal lives. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is um, an author and um, was a pastor in Nazi Germany, many of you maybe have, have heard of him, he wrote a, a small book entitled Life Together. Um, this is a book that, that Pastor Jeff oftentimes will recommend if you join a small group or a new small group is launching that, that you start um, with reading. But there's a couple, couple things I just, I just want to read from this because this, this book... Um, had a, had a large impact on me as it relates to corporate confession. His, his last chapter in this book, by the way, is called Confession and Communion. He, get, he starts by saying, there are many Christians, uh, or he says, many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered amongst the righteous. 
So we remain alone in our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is we are sinners. But it is the grace of the gospel, which is so hard for the pious to understand, that it confronts us with the truth and says, you are a sinner, a great, desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner you are to the God who loves you. It goes on to say that the expressed, acknowledged sin has lost its power. It has been revealed and judged as sin. It can no longer tear the fellowship asunder. Now the fellowship bears the sin of the brother. He is no longer alone with his evil, for he has cast off sin and confession and handed it over to God. It has been taken away from him. He now stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. That has been my experience. It's been as what God has, has taught me. And it begs the question, what if, if we as the church, what if we became the sort of confessional community that would speak God's grace into each other's life? What if we became the community whereby you and I experience healing as we confess our sins to one another? What if we had the opportunity to be the voice piece of God's act of restoration in broken lives? This is what he calls us to here as the church. My encouragement to you is don't hide. Don't hide. Live in the freedom and the hope that God intends for each of us to live in. Would you pray with me? Father, we... We cannot read your word and and miss your character. You are faithful, you are just, you are holy above all else. Lord, as we see ourselves in the light of who you are, when our sin is is revealed to us, Lord, my, my honest prayer, my hope is that we would be a community that together can go and, and, and confess sin and, and to have grace and mercy spoken into our lives, that we receive forgiveness. Lord, I pray that we would not just see Nehemiah 9 as an ancient text of a bygone era, but that we would see it as the lifeblood of the church. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.